morning. It is good to see all of you. I'm so grateful to be here. Pastor Shifra is a dear friend of mine. And it was probably a month ago. She's like, Philip, would you please come out here, man? I would really appreciate it. I was like, Shifra, absolutely. So I asked my senior pastor in Laguna. He's like, Philip, get out of here. But you got to promise you'll come back for our main service. Okay, fine. All right. All right. So after this, I got to jet out of here. Um, but I am so to be here. Thank you, Pastor Dan Smith, as well. Uh, truly a blessed, blessed church you guys have here. This morning, let me start off with a little prayer. Awesome God, you are so worthy to be praised, so worthy to be worshipped. Father, many of us come in here with uh, mixed weeks. It's been tiring, it's been exhausting, we've had troubles, we've had cares and concerns, but we are so grateful to be in the house of God. We're grateful to be uh, in a community of people that love you, that desire to grow a people that want to serve the kingdom. Lord, I pray a blessing over Garden Grove. I pray a blessing over this service. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be in this place. Speak in spite of me. In Jesus' name, amen. I was 12 years old. And you have to, I grew up as a pastor's kid, so... In my house, evangelism was like, you know, saying, what's for dinner, you know? Oh, evangelism, yeah, absolutely, let's do it, let's go, let's, let's get her done. Well, the first time I can intentionally remember that I was actively being evangelistic, quote unquote, was when one of my neighbor buddies who I was living, I lived in an apartment, so I would always have so many neighbors, man, you just knock on the wind, on the, on the, on the wall, you could say hello. And, uh, and one of my neighbors there, his name was, it was uh, Jamie, and he and I went to school together. We played basketball together. We, we did a lot of fun stuff together. And the first time I actually actively remember being, quote, unquote, evangelistic, seeking to share the gospel with somebody was Jamie. Guess the first topic that I chose to talk to him about. Just guess. Give me a topic. Sabbath, okay, that's a, that's a good one. I wish I would have used that one. What, 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 what do you think else I talked to him about? Any, Revelation, oh, they're getting closer. No, no, that's getting better. That's, yeah. What? The end days, okay. I'll tell you. The first, first topic I brought up to him, I said, listen, brother, you know in the Bible it says you shouldn't eat pork. That was the first topic I thought to bring up with this guy. I was 12 years old, take that in mind, okay? I didn't know what I was doing. And so we sat there, and I, and I, and I listened. I went to my dad, and my dad, a good soul, man. He's a, he's a good pastor. He said, Philip, what are you talking to him about? Well, he shouldn't eat pork, dad. It's bad for him. And his mom and him do it all the time. I need to tell him, set him straight. I need a scripture, dad. Where is that in the Bible? And my dad, he, I don't know what he was thinking, man, but he gave me the scripture. He said, okay, all right, here it is. And he just sent me on my way. And I shared that scripture with him, and he was convicted, man. Jamie was convicted. Can you believe that? He and his mom started eating haystacks with beef instead of pork. It was good. I taught him how to eat haystacks, too. That was good. But you see, should witnessing be this retarded like that? That you bring up the topic of, of, of pork for, is it really? Man. I want to tell you though this morning that witnessing is something not just for the preacher, the preacher's kid, or maybe a few select leaders, or those who quote unquote have the gift of witnessing or evangelism. Witnessing is a disciple's duty. Witnessing is everybody's duty. Whether you feel like you are courageous or not courageous, to share the gospel is a call of the Christian. This morning I entitled the message, The Intentional Mission of the Minority. You see, witnessing doesn't just happen. 
You don't just wake up in the morning and say, man, I hope to bring someone to Jesus. Because most of us wake up and we're already worried about the rest of the day. We're already worried what's going on, what's happening, or some of us wake up way too late and you're panicked, like, oh my gosh, it's noon. What am I doing? And you should be worried about that. You should be getting a job and getting up out of bed, man. <laughs> but anyways, the notion of being intentional with evangelism is crucial. Because unless you're intentional, it'll never get done. Daniel Mayer, in his book, Witness Essentials, evangelism that makes the writes in the very first page something I'll share with you after I read the following morning's text. Many people know the famous words of Jesus in Matthew 28 that says, go out into all the world and make disciples of men and baptizing them and teaching them all the things that I have commanded you. But many people forget that there is a mirror gospel commission in the book of Mark, Math, uh, Mar uh, Mark Chapter 16, pull your Bible out with me. Mark chapter 16 at verse 15. Mark 16 and starting in verse 15. Mark 16 starting in verse 15. And it says here, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. I love this. To all creation. Wow, so unique how, how Mark brings this out. Why would he say to all creation? And I thought the gospel needs to be preached to all creation because God wants to not only redeem humanity, but he wants to redeem the world, literally his creation. We pollute the world with so much garbage. We abuse animals left and right. And God even wants the creation to be redeemed and reconciled. Wow, how inclusive is our God. Preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed, now this is very important, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Wow. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Hmm. This morning, I want to make this appeal, and I'll say it right in the very beginning. The kingdom needs more witnesses. Can we do it one more time? The kingdom needs more witnesses. Amen. You see, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, plentiful. But what? What's the end of the verse? What? Workers are few. And why is that, I wonder? It's because we don't, each of us, each of us think that we're called to make disciples. But you see, the last words of Jesus were what? To all his disciples. The scripture is profitable for use, rebuke, doctrine, teaching. And it is for all people. And the reason that Mark, 15, Mark 16 and verses 15 and 16 are here are not for those people of that time solely but for us to wake up and realize if I don't personally take contribution and witness for the gospel, someone may be lost. And the blood, as it says in Ezekiel, will be on my... Didn't share. So I want each of us to realize that there is a weight to us being intentional about sharing the gospel. Dan Mayer, in his book, Witness Essentials, that I told you, he, he, he writes of, of a uh, Christian surveyor, a consultant, Christian leadership consultant, Ken Hunter, who did a survey about the following. He asked churchgoers, with which areas in the Christian life do you struggle most? And here are the seven most frequently voiced answers in descending order. So more people have said the first ones. I mean, less people have said the first ones and more in the last. So here we go. Number seven, okay? Number seven. Resisting temptation to immorality. That was seventh. I would have thought that would be first, man. 
Shoot, maybe it's just a guy thing, huh? Okay, all right. Number six, praying daily. Being, number five, being a good family member. Hmm. Number four, loving everyone in a Christ-like manner. Number three, reading the Bible, having a strong devotional life. Number two, seeking God's kingdom first, not worldly ways. And the number one most voiced response as to what area in the Christian life do you struggle most with was this. Being a witness for Christ. That was the most voiced response in the survey that he did of churchgoers in America. And you know what? It should be the first. It should be. Because we should actively be seeking, what is another way that I can share the gospel? I don't feel like I'm producing enough results for the kingdom. I feel like I could be used better. I feel like I have gifts to offer the kingdom. I feel like the Lord could use maybe this or this a little better. And so the number one area of confusion or challenge is how to be a more effective and faithful witness to Jesus Christ. This morning, I have a confession to make. I didn't always believe this. I thought it was the pastor's job. I thought it was those people who had that gift's job. And then I realized that if the pastor and those who have the gift of evangelism work as hard as they can, they still won't complete the job. They won't be able to. It's a job for everybody. Now, this is the thing. What is the order by which you share the gospel? What's the most important topic to share? Do you share about pork and, and how it's better to be healthy like I did when, in the first story I shared with you? Is that the first thing you bring up to someone? No. No, it's not the first thing you bring up to someone. That's not a good idea. The first thing you want to bring up with someone is, do they know Jesus? That's the very first thing before you bring up Sabbath, man, before you bring up anything else. Do they know Jesus? Now, I want to say this, though. The health message, truly, the idea of being healthy can be the right arm of the gospel. So if someone's dying of, of, of sickness, maybe that first thing could be, how can I help you get healthier? Sure. But pairing everything with, do you know Jesus? You see, they could know the 28 fundamental beliefs, but never know Jesus and be lost. Many people in church today are like that, actually. Oh, I grew up, I grew up, uh, you know, a Christian. I grew up an Adventist, and uh, I go to church on Saturday, and, and that's just what I do. I, I maybe sing up front here. I, I do that kind of thing. But we don't know Jesus. Do you know him? So that's the first thing you share. Teach people how to read their Bible. I had an opportunity of, of playing basketball. I love basketball. It's my favorite sport. I'll take anyone on. We'll play together if you want. No, I'm just kidding. No, but I'm serious. I'm serious. And, and I play basketball there in Loma Linda where I live with my wife. She's a medical student. And, and I'm playing there in the Drazen Center. And after one of the games, this one guy, or actually before the game, this one guy comes in super tired. I was like, man, it's like 1030 30. What are you tired about? Whew, man, I went to bed at like six. I was like, dang, dude. And he starts talking just about something. I don't even remember what it was. But somehow someone asked me what I do, and I said, I'm a pastor. And, and the guy says, well, why aren't you in church? It's Sunday morning. The guy who was really tired, I said, oh, I go to, I go, I go to church on Saturday. Well, that's interesting. And I asked him, right, do you go to church? Yeah, I do, but not very much. I don't really like to do that. I I try, but I, I don't know. And I don't know what it was. I just said, do you want to study the Bible? And he said, yeah, yeah, I, w I would, actually. I couldn't believe it. 
He actually said yes. I was, someone challenged me. They said, wherever you are and whatever you do, always be eager to reap. I said, what does that mean? He said, whenever you're in a circumstance, always be intentional to reap for the harvest. Ask a question that will lead toward a Bible. That will lead towards doing something to draw someone to Christ. Every place you're in. And it hit me, wow, I'm going to start doing that. And so he and I started literally just reading the Bible together. He doesn't have a relationship with Jesus at all. And so that was the very first thing I wanted to introduce him to. Very first thing. But after that, though, what, what do you share? They know Jesus. They have a relationship. They're saved by faith in Jesus Christ and not by works, meaning they are justified now. And they're walking with Christ because of his merits and the blood of Jesus, not our works. We are not saved by that. But now, we are saved by this. After we're just, and after Jesus saves us, he calls us to In the Great Commission in Matthew, it says, teach them to obey all the things I've commanded you. Well, I just bring them to Jesus and that's it and I'll leave them there. You know, the, the Lord will do the rest. Jesus will do the rest. You know, he'll, he'll help them. Man, you're a disciple maker. A disciple maker intentionally waits and walks with someone through the journey. It's not enough to just take him to Jesus and say, okay, he'll take care of you. I'll see you later. Peace, man. The disciples followed Jesus for how long? How long? Three years and a little bit more. For three years, imagine if you partnered with someone to bring them to maturity in the faith for three years. Imagine if you were so intentional that you said, I will actively seek out this person for three years and bring them to maturity. Now, Jesus will bring us to maturity, but we lead people into that. And now maturity is a lifetime issue. It goes throughout the entire life of a Christian. But imagine what you could lead them to in three years. Friends, this morning, if I didn't say anything but this, be a disciple maker. Because everybody is called to that. Let me say it one more time just to make sure. Be a disciple maker because everybody is called to that. One of my favorite pastors, his name is Francis Chan. Has anyone heard of Francis Chan at all? Yeah, okay, good. He wrote a phenomenal book I want to I share with you. It's called Multiply, Disciples Making Disciples. And he has this whole program on how to make disciples and leading people from a decision to just know about Christ and teaching them about New Testament, Old Testament, and leading them into greater walks as a Christian. And you see, why I admire this man is because he left a, a, a mega church. He was a pastor of a premier mega church in, in the Simi Valley, thousands of church members. And I said, the Lord is calling me to leave this place and go to Africa. And he wanted to go across the world with his entire family. And there, as they're making decisions on where they're going to live, literally they were in the country there, and they were making decisions where to live, he felt compelled. And he realized he was leaving too soon because he understood that he was just one person trying to make disciples. But the kingdom is about everybody making disciples. Not just the pastor. Not just some one radical and his family. Oh, they're going to go make disciples out there and, and, and it'll change the world. No, it's about you making disciples. This morning, I, I want to allow an opportunity for silence. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. 
We don't have enough silence in church. A lot of noise, a lot. And so in this moment, I want to give you a moment of silence. About a minute and a half or so. Maybe a little bit more. Two minutes, three. I want you to listen to the Lord speak. What does this mean? Go and baptize them. Go into all the world. What does that mean for you in your life? Who has God put in your life that you need to bring to Jesus and bring them to a, a place of walking with Christ? What does that mean? No sleeping, thinking, praying. The theme for the month is the universal majority. That there are a lot more witnesses out there than we think. That the angels, that those in other worlds maybe, that, that they are working on our behalf. But guess what? If they're working, why aren't we? They're slaving, they're giving their time, their efforts, their, their work for the kingdom, but why don't we actually then join them? Yes, individuals may have a guardian angel that is watching over them, caring for them, ensuring that everything is done for their behalf, but what if now you and I partnered with them? You see, when you go and talk to someone, it's not just you and them talking. There are four people involved. You, me, his angel, my angel. There are three people working on behalf of that person. Whoa, that's awesome. But you know what, though? We work also in a kingdom where not many people understand that, that we are in a minority. See, the clarity of God's word isn't fully understood we are Adventist. We are of the smallest denomination in America. We are a mini minority. But now what if America started awaking to the ideas that God's word still holds true today and that tradition isn't the trump card that you can place over scripture? I just listened to a sermon last weekend of an evangelical pastor preaching about the Ten Commandments, and he was preaching about the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath. And he got so many blogs, uh, comments on his, on his Facebook saying, Pastor, don't you realize that the Fourth Commandment is still legit for us today? And I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. So many in the evangelical world are waking up that the Sabbath is legitimate. Because people are in such a sick 
cycle of work and work and work and work and they're getting tired. And they're realizing that God did create the Sabbath for them. And that, in, as Hebrews 4 says, that Sabbath rest still remains. Now, while we are in a minority in this Christian denomination, God is calling us to share as a minority with the megaphone of a majority. Friends, the character of God is at stake after they know about Jesus, then start sharing with them the truth of the beauty of the sanctuary and how Jesus is actually on their behalf right now praying for them. Share about the beauty of, of the second coming. Do you realize that there are some denominations that don't even think there will be a literal second coming? They just think that their eyes are going to be opened one day maybe and they'll see the dimension that's out there. Do you realize that, that some people don't understand that, that the spiritual gifts are for today, for this world? That the Sabbath is still a beautiful thing for us? Friends, it's time for us to witness. It's time for us to share. It's time for this minority to be mission-minded. See, it's not enough for you to be part of a minority who's quote-unquote, well, we're in the truth, we've got the truth. Well, you know what? If you're part of a minority and you're not mission-minded, you're in the majority, actually. Because that's what the rest of the world does. They just do their duty. They go to church and then they leave. I I've done my peace with God. I'm done. See ya. And then they go live their life for six days without ever intentionally thinking about God without ever intentionally trying to lead someone to Jesus. Guys, the kingdom is at stake. People's lives are at stake. Mark said if they believe, they'll be saved. But if they don't, they won't be saved. Because there's only one way into the kingdom, and it's through Jesus. So if this minority can wake up, become intentionally mission-minded, seeing that I am a servant for the kingdom, it is a contribution that can bless the world, not for works, not so that I can be saved, but simply so that someone else can. Wow. Wow. Friends, it takes a community to wake up and get on fire and for each of us to do our part, and this place will be packed. You'll need a third service, a fourth, a new church. Because there will be a community that realizes that my contribution for the kingdom is not only a blessing, but it is essential to, as a Christian. I'll repeat this one more time. If you're not witnessing, you're not a Christian. Because the blessing of Jesus is not just personal. It's about you being blessed so much that your cup overflows, the Bible says. If your cup isn't overflowing, my brother and sister, I would say question if you are a believer of Jesus. It is that radical. Because Jesus isn't about just let me get a bunch of people to follow me and they'll just watch me and, and then they'll, they'll leave it to those elders and, and preachers to do the job. No, he said, I have called you, Joel. I have called you. I have called you. And if you accept me, then follow me. Go into all the world and baptize them and teach them. And if they accept, they will have the blessing of the kingdom. Amen. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray that your people will accept the call to truly be Christians to truly do what they have said they would do 
and that is to follow you. In the quietness of this place, I ask that you would respond to the call of Jesus to be a witness. If you have understood the message this morning, to be an intentionally mission-minded minority with the megaphone of a majority, I would ask this morning if your heart has been convicted Would you stand and come forward? That you need to share. If your heart has been convicted so, I would ask that you would come forward. You don't have to if your heart isn't convicted. Don't do it, man. It's better for you to sit and get right with the Lord. But if you realize God is calling you to something serious and legitimate about the gospel and going forward as a witness, please, I would ask you to come forward. Is there anyone else this morning who realizes the essence of what God is calling them to do? I would ask you to come forward. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Father, there are people that have stood, that have come forward, that realize that their life is maybe not where they want it to be in terms of witnessing, but they have a great desire to be obedient to the Holy Spirit that is prompting their heart in this moment, saying, Lord, I really want to follow you. I really want to make disciples. I may not know how, God, but I know you will show me. And so, Father, in the moment here that we are in, I pray that you would set a special an anointing over this group right here, Father. I pray, God, that you would empower them with the power of the gospel as as Peter preached when he was abused and beaten. Lord, don't protect me, but give me boldness now to preach more fervently, to bring more into the kingdom. And so, God, I pray that you would do this now, that you would embolden your people, that their fears would be taken away and that they would move forward in a powerful way. The gospel would be proclaimed through their lips. Who will go from me? Whom shall I send, God asks. I will go. Lord, your people have stood. Lord, I pray that you would bless those sitting, Lord. May they not feel left out. May you bless them as well. And any seed that has been in their hearts, God, I pray that you would raise it up. And Lord, thank you for those who are being faithful and sharing the gospel actively with their faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I would ask if you stood that you would promise me one thing, that you would go see Pastor Dan. Come see me if you're in our church. I want to thank some of my young adults and leaders who came here from Laguna Niguel, that you would go and see one of these leaders and that you would say, Pastor Dan, Pastor Phil, I want to know how I can be a bit more intentional. Please do that.